kind of introduction that I do with the, oh, with the entire can I get to so that? Do I get the that? hour, I will transition to you guys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do I get to see what you're saying for 15 minutes? You're not going to be able to see here. You will only be able to see if you're looking at the app or if you're, uh, which, uh, which we actually tell you not to do that on your desktop because it can feed back to, to this session. Right. But if you have a phone or another computer, you can look at it over there. Okay. Oh, it'll be, they'll be able to see here. Okay. I didn't know that. Thank you for that. <laughs> I've never been here when I'm, when I'm talking. <laughs> I'm only going to ask Jude the questions from now on. <laughs> you should. You should. That's a smart move. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Business Transformation and Operational Excellence World Summit, Beatles from Home, where we accelerate culture, business, and digital transformations by creating environments where great people and great ideas can connect. I am Jose Pires. I'm the CEO of Global Excellence and Innovation, and I'm very proud to be your host in this summit. 2020 has been filled with unique challenges and Beatles from Home is an amazing opportunity to learn and share how operational excellence, innovation, technology, culture, business, and digital transformations are reshaping the way we work and live. But first, let's cover some of the exciting things that are happening around us in this event. Make sure that you're using the Beatles from Home desktop and mobile app to select and attend your sessions. You can connect and network with other participants. And we also ask that you give us feedback by rating the speakers and their content in the event app. Make sure that you visit the virtual booths and start scheduling meetings to win amazing giveaways. If you schedule and attend five meetings on the virtual booths, you get access to the recording of the Disney Innovation and Leadership Full Day Workshop. It's priced at about $1,000, and you're going to get that for free if you attend five meetings in the virtual booths. Also, we have asked all virtual booths to offer special giveaways and prizes for the attendees that schedule and attend meetings. So make sure you do that. Make sure that you explore all that's available in terms of insights, in terms of new technologies, and, uh, and the best, really, uh, in terms of the future of the industry that's displayed on these virtual booths with uh, incredible representatives of, of these organizations uh, able to connect with you and explain in more detail some of the new tools, techniques, um, approaches that are accelerating excellence and innovation in our industry. Here at the main stage, we'll have three types of events. Um, We're going to have keynote presentations by leading industry experts. We'll have live panel sessions, which is a group of, key, of experts uh, from different industries coming together and debating very relevant topics for our time and for our industry. And we'll also have workshops and special ceremonies right here. But there's a whole lot more going on in several tracks, not here on the main stage and, and special events, including the industry awards, which will take place today at 3.45 p.m. Eastern time. We're gonna have the best of the best finalists and we will announce the winners for several categories of business transformation and operational excellence. 
we'll have organization awards, we'll have project awards, and we'll have stewardship awards or leadership awards. So you do not want to miss that because you get to see what the best look like. You have a description in the app of the projects and programs that they have been leading. And, uh, and we will discuss also the judging panel, the cross industry judging panel who evaluated the submissions. And we had a record number of submissions in 2020, despite all the things that are happening around the world. It's, it's amazing to see how progressive organizations are accelerating excellent, accelerating innovation during this time. And that's gonna be displayed at the awards ceremony at 3.45 p.m. today. You do not wanna miss that. Um, also, soon after the awards ceremony, we're going to have an awards after party. And that's a limited number of people who can get into that. So make sure that you sign up for that and you show up because on that, uh, on that celebration after the awards, what we'll do, we'll have you have access directly to the award winners. So they will be um, part of the smaller groups that we're gonna create in those sessions. And then you've got a chance to uh, talk about the awards, talk about you know, their organizations, what they're doing, so on and so forth. So uh, make sure to take advantage of that and, uh, it's, uh, and learn directly, not from the people who are theorizing about improvements and innovations, but from the ones who are doing it actively on their organizations right now, despite of the potentially adverse conditions that they may be dealing with. They understand that we create the future and what we do today matters disproportionately in times of uncertainty and rapid change. Having the discipline to be consistent with your purpose is key. And they, they are great examples of that. Now, each keynote presentation here on the main stage will be about 35 minutes followed by a 10 minute Q&A. And that Q&A is your opportunity to submit questions that are important to your context. So don't be shy, ask the questions that matter most to you. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna be looking at the questions that you pose. There is a ranking system that you can vote for each other's questions that will raise a question up depending on how many people believe that that question should be asked. And I'm gonna be monitoring that in real time. Okay, now I wanna make sure that that feature is working. So I have another display here that's giving me the feedback on the questions or comments that you make. So please do me a favor, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay, everybody can, can see me okay, go ahead and type in there right now, go into the session, click on the session, go into the call out for live discussions, and uh, under chat or under questions, put it under chat for now, under chat, go ahead and tell me where are you coming from today? Uh, what city, country are you coming from today? Uh, we have over 2,000 registered participants in this ecosystem right now. And, uh, and I believe you're coming from all over the world and uh, based on what we saw yesterday. So go ahead. I already have good morning from Washington, D.C. right here. Detroit, Michigan has already shown up. And uh, I, I have Monterey, Mexico uh, uh, coming up. And go ahead and put on the chat, what it, where are you coming from today? So I can see your feedback, and that's the way that I'm gonna communicate directly with the, with the speakers doing our live Q&A. So looking forward to that, looking forward to our uh, interaction during the event, during each one of these events. Yesterday, we had an awesome session here, awesome sessions here at the main stage. We learned how the Air Force is focusing on cultural transformations to inspire airmen to think differently varying from a culture of inherent compliance to one that accepts questions to an improvement and innovative culture that is data focused and data driven and uh, and, uh, and 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 really disproportionately uh, attentive to value creation um, so bro goche did a fantastic presentation on that topic that was followed up by a terrific panel with google Morningstar Financials and the Thought Exchange, and where we discuss the future of work and, uh, and the impact of COVID-19 in the development of the new normal and, uh, and what may go back to the old normal and what will never go back to the old normal. So some of those points 
were there, uh, were made yesterday. Uh, some very interesting insights from different perspectives, a technology company, a financial services company, a company that, that is doing um, uh, collaboration, uh, virtual collaborations at scale with the Thought Exchange. So it was a super interesting discussion, uh, very insightful, and you asked some very relevant questions during that discussion. Also, uh, we had the CEO of Innovation 360, directly from Stockholm, Sweden, discuss how to play bold and win the business game by using creative destruction. Magnus Panker did a masterclass on what it looks like from a historical perspective when companies disrupt themselves, disrupt entire industries, and what does the next decade look like? Um, and then we finalize the proceedings here in the main stage with a terrific panel with uh, HP, Morningstar Financials, and UiPath discussing how robotics process automation and intelligent automation in general is accelerating innovation and value creation across organizations and entire industries. Uh, and this has been an incredible time for innovation accelerated acceleration driven by um, you know by exponential technologies. Certainly robotics process automation and you have process mining, uh, NLP, AI, and, and a blockchain, and a host of other technologies that are, that, are, that are making a difference today in the way that these organizations create value. Now, you may be thinking, I wish I had watched these presentations yesterday. I wasn't able to watch them live when they took place. So if you're pondering about that, or especially if you're new, if you're coming in for the first time into the conference today, I have good news for you. And the good news is that those sessions are recorded. So they're available to you right now. You can go back to yesterday, click on the, each one of the sessions, and you'll be able to access the entire content. And that's, that's awesome because that's going to be available to you for a full year uh, after this conference is completed. So this is the value that Beatles from Home is bringing to you. And uh, not to mention the thousands of connections that you can make in this environment with industry leaders because their profiles and their bios are up and you can see who you know these leaders in the organizations and what they do and that uh, you can connect directly with them so there is no other uh, conference that offers this package of value and uh, we're grateful for that and certainly very grateful for our platinum sponsors who allowed us to bring this to you at a global scale so i have to say a big thank you to Booz Allen Hamilton, IBM, Celonis, Nintex, Signavio, The Thought Exchange, Blueprint, and Finair for making the sessions available to all of us on a global scale. It, it just couldn't be done without the, our platinum sponsors stepping up in times of uncertainty, rapid change, uh, challenges for so many around the world, uh, and they're creating this incredible opportunity that uh, to connect virtually and have this depth of content available to everyone who is a registered participant. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this ecosystem of great people and great ideas that can connect to accelerate improvements, to accelerate innovations all over the world. Now, let's take a quick look at what's coming up today. Uh, we're going to have a session initially, a keynote session with the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Jennifer Ford is with us. Tim Anderson's with us. He's gonna, they're going to be talking about this incredible transformation that the Veteran Health Veteran Affairs is, is going through. And uh, it, it, the scale is just mind-boggling. Jennifer and Tim are going to talk about it. And, uh, and uh, you, you know, I didn't even realize before when I started looking to the research on the veteran affairs for preparing for this session, I didn't realize the scale. And I think that the, that's something that I want you to pay attention to. They are transforming things at a scale and reach that's, that's, that's incredible. Now, after that, we're here on the main stage, we will have a session, a, key, a keynote panel discussion on the secrets to large scale business transformation success. On that one, we're gonna have a new George who is a, a C-level leader at Morningstar Financials. We're going to have Riaz Attar talking about the transformations, large-scale transformations at Caesars Entertainment. And we're going to have Kelly Pierce, who leads transformation for MasterCard. And, uh, and that session is, is a follow-up on what large, successful uh, business transformations look like. 
after that, we're going to meet back here at 1245 for a first workshop, an exciting workshop with Adam Lawrence on the wheels of sustainability and engaging and empowering teams to ensure that their solutions live on. And then in the afternoon, we are going to have a fireside chat for 45 minutes, questions only, real time, with the leader for change and transformation at Google. I have the pleasure to interview Travis Haler, and Travis Haler is an expert on the neuroscience of change. You do not want to miss the session. This is unique. Um, it's one of the greatest organizations in the world and the leaders who are driving change in an organization that's built for change. So, uh, and it's done from a very scientific perspective and how do they translate those scientific principles into action that creates value for the people and the organization. So the neuroscience of change fireside chat with Google at 2.15 p.m. And then without further ado, we are going to move on to wrap up our day with the award ceremony. Award ceremony at 345, I already talked about that, followed by the, uh, the, awards, uh, the awards after party. So full day, very excited about it. And, uh, and I hope you take advantage of all of the main stage sessions, main stage sessions, plus all the other sessions that are happening in parallel. All right, very well. Without further ado, let me bring our next keynote speakers to start us in a great, with a great presentation about the Department of Veteran Affairs, creating, executing, and sustaining a high reliability organization in healthcare. So we have Jennifer Ford and Tim Anderson with us. So I'm gonna do a quick bio on them. This, this, these are veterans of improvement and innovation, and it's a real privilege to have, to have them with us. First, I have Jennifer with us. She is the Director of Product Effectiveness at Veterans Health Administration. She possesses nearly two decades of healthcare experience and expertise. Ms. Ford works to implement strategic direction and evidence-based assessments in order to maximize the intended value of the healthcare outcomes. She leads the team responsible for measuring the benefits of the VHA's investments to ensure optimal clinical outcomes and operational productivity. Jennifer specializes in high reliability organizations, healthcare access, learning organizations, and health IT programs and products. She's a published author and frequent speaker at national and international conferences. In addition to her work at VHA, she's a professor at George Washington University, where she has been teaching for over six years. Jennifer, what a pleasure to have you with us. Tim, thank you. Tim Anderson. Team led a facility-wide high reliability project from 2016 to 2019 at the Truman VAMC. This project, including conducted CTT to over 40 clinical and non-clinical units and over 1,500 employees receiving CTT. The HRO project, including developing and implementing 75 department-level continuous process improvement boards. This HRO efforts contribute to Truman VA being the number one overall among all 154 VA medical centers for three consecutive years. He was selected as the VIS-15 Chief High Reliability Officer for VHA Heartland Network in July of 2019. He now serves as a VHA HRO Steering Committee participant and has participated in several Steering Committee work groups, including HRO metrics, HRO assessments, and as a faculty of the VHA HRO. Tim, welcome. It's a real honor for me to have this caliber of transformation leaders with us, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jose, and welcome Beto's attendees from all over the world. As Jose mentioned, my name is Jennifer Ford, and I, along with my colleague, Tim Anderson, will be speaking to you about creating, executing, and sustaining a high reliability organization in healthcare. I know that you have many priorities, and so we are very grateful that you chose to spend the time with us this morning, or in the afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I know that you, uh, uh, but first, I wanna take a quick look at what is a high reliability organization and what does it mean to create and execute one? Let's start with breaking down the term reliability. It's the quality of being trustworthy and performing consistently well. It also is the result of a measurement, a calculation, or a specification that 
we depend on to be accurate. So most of us drive a car, right? We depend on the fact that the brakes will work when we apply them. We have flown from city to city in an airplane. We expect that when we fly, we get to, we'll be at the destination safely. But if any of these expectations don't hold true, the results can be fatal. Seems like common sense. You're like, Jennifer, why are you telling me this? And why are you wasting my time for the next 45 minutes telling me about reliability? But what if there's a breakdown in communications in a multi-layered, high hazard, complex environment? To illustrate this, what I'm gonna do is take you back to January 28th, 1986. It was a very unusually cold morning in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center as the whole world was about to watch an historical event. Please roll tape. Let's go down to the Kennedy Space Center and take a look at Challenger sitting on the pad. Nine, eight, seven, six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Engines at 65%, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. So the 25th Space Shuttle mission is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second. Altitude 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We're awaiting word there, holding their breath. obviously a major malfunction. The catastrophe you just witnessed was the Space Shuttle Challenger. Many of us were in school, sitting at the edge of our seats, watching this, and it was historical because it was the first time a teacher, one of our own, was going to go up into space exploration. 72 seconds, se sorry, 73 seconds into the journey, seven souls had expired. So what went wrong? After many delays, it was determined that the O-rings were faulty in cold climates. But was that the real problem? Actually, it wasn't. The real problem was 12 hours before that flight was to take off, NASA engineers emphatically told NASA management not to take off, that the O-rings would not hold in the cold climates. Obviously, there was a commission to look at the root cause analysis of this disaster and it was ultimately determined that the serious, there was a serious flaw in the decision-making process leading up to the launch. The translation to this is this disaster could have been avoided. So next time you get one of those recalls on your car, or you're sitting on the, you might want to take your car in right away, or you're sitting on the tarmac and you're frustrated that the plane's not taking off, maybe you want to kind of take a step back. What we have learned by studying literature about high reliability organizations is they all have these five major principles and characteristics. They are preoccupied with failure. What this means is that everybody in the organization is a problem solver. They look for cracks in the foundation and look to fix those cracks in the foundation. There's absolutely no turning a blind eye and they're only drawn to improving the organization's ability to thrive. Next is reluctance to simplify. Don't cut corners, check and recheck your list, get down to the root of the matter. Sensitivity to operations. Operations happen every second of the day and a leader cannot be at every place at the same time watching over everybody that's working. 
Therefore, we must rely on our frontline staff to tell us what's going well and what could be improved. They are the ones who can educate us and make us more highly reliable. But don't ignore them ever. They are some of the organization's greatest assets. A commitment to resilience, understanding and exposing weaknesses and where you might be wrong is very difficult to do. But if you have the guts to uncover some of these weaknesses and make it transparent to the organization, your ability to reduce risks and uh, safety events exponentially increases. And finally, deference to ex expertise. Well, if NASA's management had only listened to the experts. So what does this mean to healthcare? Everything. Healthcare too operates in a multi-layered, high hazard complex environment. As a matter of fact, Jose mentioned the order of magnitude of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Let me just sort of reiterate what our transformation and our modernization efforts look like in terms of size. We're 172 hospitals across the United States with about 900 outpatient clinics. We have 320,000 employees and we spend tens of billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars over the next, we will be spending that over the next 10 years in transforming and modernizing. Just imagine trying to get 320,000 employees to transform. In healthcare, a breakdown in communication though, can literally mean the difference between life or death. And in fact, preventable, preventable medical errors is actually our third largest cause of death. Again, preventable. Misdiagnoses, surgical errors, and medication errors are usually the most preventable errors and the most prominent. How many times have you gone to a doctor and you say to your, and your doctor says, hey, if we don't call you, everything is fine. Now imagine that you had a cancer diagnosis and it got misplaced and you were never called. Not only is this devastating, but it actually happens more frequently than not. My advice to you, always double check your diagnoses and be very proactive with your healthcare. Surgical errors also haunt the industry. Imagine waking up from surgery and only to find out that the shoulder, your healthy shoulder was, was the one that was operated on and now you have chronic pain in that one and have to go back into surgery to actually fix the shoulder that needed to be fixed in the first place. And finally, medication errors. Adverse drug events happen all the time. Medication reconciliation is a constant issue. Drug to drug interactions and missed allergic reactions are unfortunately commonplace. Again, what do these errors have in common? Preventable. The necessity to operationalize a high reliability organization in healthcare is clear and evident. But where do we begin? How do I do this? We hope to provide some of those answers to you today. So how to create, execute, and sustain an HRO is also a multi-layered, complex task, and it happens over time. Well, we at the VA have a gem called Truman Medical Center in Columbia, Missouri. It has over 1,700 employees and all have adopted the principles of high reliability in terms of leadership commitment, a culture of safety, which also we refer to as just culture, you'll be hearing that term from us, and continuous process improvement. Ten years ago, they set out to create the hospital of the future, a high reliable facility where our veterans can, can access services in a timely manner, be safe, and also experience an exceptional and consistent visit every time they step foot in the door. But it even gets better. Our employees get to get those same advantages. They gain access to a safe workplace. They're able to and encouraged and rewarded to speak up so transparency occurs and you gain a high level of employee satisfaction as a result. So now my colleague, Tim Anderson, will explain how the condition and tone was set at Truman so that the foundations of leadership commitment and a culture of safety or just culture in our structure here was created. Tim? Thank you, Jennifer. As you see in this slide, we chose leadership commitment as the bricks for the foundation of our high reliability journey, which is now being replicated across all of VHA. Uh, this included both 
clinical and administrative leadership commitment. Um, I think frequently when you try to operationalize HRO, you look at the clinical piece only, but it, it will frustrate your clinicians if you're not looking at the business operations, the logistics, the prosthetics, the IT, and the other non-clinical support services. So we made a mindful effort to look at capability and reliability within the non-clinical and administrative areas. And we committed to a long-term process, like Jennifer mentioned, we had a three-year project, but it started 10 years, 10 years ago in 2010 when we uh, started applying for Aldridge. Leaders across the journey had to be educated and had to have a certain skill set in order to, to be on this journey. And this was hardwired into their executive career contracts. Their performance was dependent on their knowledge and ability to be a part of this journey. And although we had uh, challenges moving to a zero harm goal, zero, well, I think most of the leaders who stayed on for the journey very much embraced it. And it started with, uh, if the leadership commitment was the bricks, the culture of safety was more to hold this together. The second piece of the, the uh, three pillars. And we had a shared, foundational definition, and we operationalized that with a just culture decision support tool based on David Marks' work. And this created the culture of safety by hardwiring a decision process on how we would respond to all deviations, patient safety incident reporting in our employee relations, labor relations. We had a, a strong union presence. And probably the greatest same shared environment where we had non negotiable respect for people was an event, a legacy event in 2013 on the locked behavioral health unit. We had an acutely psychotic schizophrenic patient admitted onto a general psychiatry locked ward. And he was hearing voices. And at the time, there were not a whole lot of resources for elderly veterans who have dementia and no other uh, mental health needs. So there was a 78-year-old uh, World War II veteran on the unit with dementia, unable to care for himself, looking for placement. The social work was working actively to place the fellow. And the 38-year-old who was admitted around midnight continued to hear voices through the night. And the next afternoon, he beat to death the 78-year-old demented fellow, thinking he was uh, possessed demonically by spirits. And this was in the hallway for all the veteran patients and the staff to see. They were unable to pull him off. He was a large former Marine. And in the after action root cause analysis, there was a, a number of uh, systematic changes to the processes on that unit, including $800,000 remodel that included direct lines of sight for the staff to see patients at all times and cameras and integrated computer docking stations that were designed in a manner that could not be taken apart or used to harm anyone. But probably more importantly was an, an aggression assessment scale that the chief and I, chief of staff and I developed where every patient that was admitted to the unit had an aggression scale rating and their treatment plan was based on that aggression scale. And while this uh, root cause analysis was being conducted, the, the network director of our healthcare system in the Midwest was receiving pressure from the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington, D.C. to have some disciplinary action towards the treatment team, specifically the attending physician or the head nurse of the unit, including termination. And the network director at the time, who's still the network director, he said, absolutely not. There were way too many system issues that were identified in this root cause analysis that was also verified when the Office of Inspector General investigated the event, and they found no reason for any kind of disciplinary measures that it was a system issue. So this 2013 event, it became legacy. That was reflected in 2017 to 2019 in the all-employee survey results that Jose talked about, where Truman VA was number one overall for workforce satisfaction. And I think that was the mortar that solidified the culture of safety and psychological safety at the Truman VA. All this is predicated on a uh, systematic messaging that the CEO and myself did to 
message how this is going to change how we operate. This is going to become the fabric of our operations. And we based it on the, some of the TED Talks from Simon Semenik on how people want to be communicated. We started with the what. Traditionally, that would be we are a hospital. The how being we are specialized experts in a wide variety of care, including prosthetics research and, and mental health. And then the behavior, come get care from us. And we would change that, that why message to we exist to care for American heroes and provide safe care. That really changes it from being a hospital to we're providing care for heroes. There's a high quality healthcare here that makes a difference in our heroes' lives. The how was specialized care and a wide range of healthcare services, and we transform veterans' lives by going above and beyond everyday healthcare. And finally, we're a world class hospital. Come and see it for yourself. So this messaging became hardwired into everything we message for reliability. The team commitment for the executive leaders really transformed what their daily calendar looks like. About halfway into the journey, it was not unusual for the CEO of the hospital to have 40 hours out of the month for high reliability activity. They would attend high reliability training, clinical team training, which is the VA's version of team steps, just culture training. Uh, it was a recognized lean leader, went through yellow belt, green belt, and black belt training. He or the other executive leaders would provide introductions to all high reliability activities, including uh, lean training, clinical team training, patient safety forums, walk arounds. And his calendar and his executive calendars became filled up with high reliability activities, including visiting those 75 visual management boards for continuous process improvement. So that it, his thought was, as was mine, leaders who are not visible aren't leading. And they didn't attend the rounds and they didn't attend the boards as subject matter experts. It was just to show the visible support and help identify barriers to continuous process improvement becoming a learning organization. One of the bellwether moments in that clinical team training was we had a general surgeon. He was a respected surgeon. He was respected at the University of Missouri. Frequently, he was uh, teaching the medical residents and the, and the medical students on surgical equipment. And I, I had observed him a number of times in the operating room, and, and he would literally take apart a piece of machinery about what was going wrong with it. He went through the clinical team training. He developed a debriefing at the end of every case. And about six months later, I went back after his training to observe some of his cases. And he had an endoscopy tower that did not have a vacuum attached to it. So there would be a, a bit of smoke when the cauterization took place. And he felt like that smoke was toxic to the team and potentially to the veteran patient. So instead of putting in a, a safety report and a request to get this vacuum, he got on the phone right away and called biomedical engineering, and he had the biomedical engineering staff bring over that vacuum, attach it to the tower, and eliminate that risk right at the OR table before the veteran even left the operating room. And I, and I felt like that was a bellwether moment in changing the frontline physician's approach to high reliability. Next, we're gonna have Jennifer talk about some of the details that allowed the psychological safety and the leadership to make continuous process improvement really the sustaining piece, consistent sustaining piece for the house on which the foundation was built for the culture of safety and the leadership commitment. Thank you, Tim. So everyone, you've heard terms such as hardwiring and psychological safety. Um, these terms, the, these terms and the activities just described all lead to what we call a shared mental model. So remember when you were a kid and you were sitting in a row, one of the games you played was the telephone game and you would whisper a phrase to your partner or your friend next to you and they would whisper it to the next person, so on and so forth. And at the end of the telephone game, 
the message that was revealed was completely skewed and muddled from what it was originally um, set. So what we, when we apply these HRR principles and the components that we just learned about, what we look to do is minimize that issue of the telephone game and, and quite frankly, create this shared mental model where we're all interpreting the messages uh, the same or similarly. So operation, obviously operationalizing this effort is just absolutely not an easy task, especially when we are seeking evidence-based information to make decisions. But we have made, with this case study, major breakthroughs in the VA. Um, but what's even more exciting is that this foundation has led to a phenomenal change in the organization with unprecedented results. So the conclusion here is that just culture leads to, leads to consistent, deliberate, not random continuous process improvements, which includes the entire organization, not just certain parts of the organization. And it all starts with a simple visual communication board, a whiteboard, if you will, a gathering place to communicate. The simplicity of this board is brilliant. The impact of this board is unimaginable. 73, per, 73 of these boards were distributed and implemented across the Truman VA to every clinical and non-clinical unit. As you can see, the boards are divided into the plan, do, act, results process, and also, some, and also just do it. So the board is placed at each unit and is a constant reminder that there's ideas that can be approved upon or that I can add ideas to this board. The needs could be as complex as a surgical innovation, as Tim described, or as not as complex, but important as wheelchair maintenance. On the right-hand side of the board, you see these slips in various, various forms. What happens is somebody sees something and they simply write something on a slip and attach it to the board. Then people gather around the board of all levels of the unit. So from you know, the front line to the leadership and they discuss the ideas on the board and lend everybody's viewpoint and expertise to solving the problem. What happens is groupthink starts to form, collaboration happens naturally, and the best outcomes for the unit are achieved. So what my organization does, Tim went ahead and implemented this amazing transformation. And what I do is I try to evaluate it for effectiveness and value. So as a mental poll, how many of these process improvement ideas do you think were captured between this time period, 2015 and 2019? So if you answer D, you are correct. In fact, there was 3,184 improvement ideas over those five years. So let's take a look at the distribution of them. So the boards were starting to be implemented in 2015, and by 2017, all of the boards had been implemented and the folks had been trained on how to use them. So look at the increase, the incredible increase in improvement ideas from 2017 to 2019. If you think about this, if there's 365 days in the year, a, a person might work a maximum of 232 days out of the year. If you take out a two week vacation, 10 holidays, and maybe five sick, sick, sick leave days. So if you divide that number 232 into each one of these years in 2017, that leads to two improvement ideas per day. 2018, four per day. And 2019, six per day. And we are still counting. So then we had to decide, well, how do you take all this data? What do you, how do you capture it? What do you do with it? So we had to come up with a database schema with tags and searchable items so that we can start to analyze the incredible amount of data that we collected. And what we were looking for is to see if we could find tangible and demonstrative results. And here's what we found. This may or may not surprise you, but there's roughly a 60-40 split in, uh, in improvement ideas between operational and clinical care, respectively. So what does this mean to leadership? I can see this 
as being able to determine where I've realized benefits and innovations and also where I might need to focus future investments. We then thought, well, wait a minute, we can't just have all of these ideas and split into clinical versus non-clinical. How do we know what the impact is to the organization? What's the significance? So then we said, okay, well, we're gonna put some definition around this. So a high impact project is something that is multi-tiered, multi-layered throughout the organization. Medium might be an innovation that's really just in a clinic or a unit and low is something that almost just can be solved immediately. So an idea, an example of a high impact project would be the, um, well, we realized that there was inadequate oral hygiene between some of our high risk elderly patients. They were acquiring hospital acquired pneumonia. So just by simply ordering toothbrushes and making sure that toothbrushes were in every single hospital room, it was determined that not only did we help to prevent the virus, but we saved $40,000 per incident saved. A medium impact uh, idea might be something like needing a hook in the ICU unit to display the IV bag during a co code red. Many times, and obviously with a code red in frantic situations, the bags were in different places in different rooms. Consistently putting the bags on the hook consistently in every room really saved a lot of time and things that you don't have to think about in a, in a high, stressful situation. And in terms of a low, it may be something like, you know, I might need some type of supplies to do my job better. Some of the lows were categorized as a light bulb needs to be changed. However, the problem with that is that could also be a high impact because with the light bulb, you might be able to uh, be able to prevent a fall from happening. Okay, so with these types of examples in mind, the results were eye-opening when you kind of take a look at which ones fell into high, medium, and low categories. 15% of those uh, slips fell into high impact categories and 40% fell into medium. So if you recall back in 2019 distribution, there was 1,461 slips. If you do the math, that leads to 219 high impact projects and 584 medium projects per year. That's one per day that's being uncovered for a high impact and two per day in medium. And if you recall, the medium impacts aren't too shabby. As a leader of an organization, am I not only proud of that, but the results are just measurably off the charts. And our success continued. Healthcare is extremely siloed. Many efforts have been underway to break these silos like value-based care and bundle payments. But true value is derived by integrating teams, which instills confidence in the organization and helps to reduce redundancies and errors. The Baldridge organization promotes a framework of performance excellence. They have, they, in their scorecard system, they demand integration as one of the critical success factors. Through our analysis, Truman was able to demonstrate 33% of their projects had a significant degree of integration. A third of the projects is a great number. We obviously strive to improve that number, but what an excellent start. And then further analysis helped us uncover the trending and themes that were emerging. Of the 3,184 improvements, they all fell into these nine, top 19 ca <coughs> excuse me, categories from suicide prevention, medication developments, care coordination, all the way to improvements in communications, inventory, teamwork, and process changes. It is no wonder that Truman went from being 75th to number one in best places to work within the VA. They also decreased employee burnout by 52%. Impressive results. And of course, no analysis is complete unless we do a return on investment. Besides the benefits we just previously went through, of psychological and patient safety, this organization realized a $2.8 million savings in cost savings and cost avoidances. Through this assessment, leaderships can gain tangible assets to be able to make decisions on future, or uh, to be able to make decision-making decisions on future environments for a safer environment, for greater patient experience, and really truly 
continuing to become an, an HRO. So when you tally all the evidence that's been presented to you today, just now, we can really just summarize all of this into seven distinct and highly high valuable findings. Number one, as I just mentioned, ROI is, is paramount. Funds are not unlimited. And, and truly, demonstrating improvements while reducing cost directly speaks to proving healthcare value. Expecting just culture is only half the battle, but demonstrating it and sustaining it is truly innovative. Instilling just culture is a dependency to a consistent and growing continuous process improvement environment. Consistent, not random, being the operative word. How many times has your leadership set out to meet objectives only to find out the members of the organization don't really know what, how to interpret the goals of the organization? What this process does is reduces that ambiguity and this method provides the justification and validation that the goals are met. By documenting your successes, others can learn from your strong practices and your mistakes. We here at the VA strive a learning organization. Being the largest integrated hospital network in the United States, our learning organization strives to demonstrate the reluctance to simplify, sensitivity to operations, and an organization's commitment to resilience. Performing trending analysis is yet another insight where leaders can identify particular points of failure and look to avoid future safety events. It also gives us an outlook on future strategies and needs of the organization. You've all heard the term, if I knew then what I knew now, or otherwise known as Monday morning quarterbacking. Mitigating risk is one of the most challenging things to do in an organization. An HRO is constantly detecting risk early throughout all parts of the organization. All levels of the organization have the ability to bring their expertise forward to avoid safety events from happening. So I ask you, wouldn't you be glad to know that your food service employee double checked the tray so that they didn't place a piece of chocolate cake on for a diabetic? Or how about, would you, would you love the fact to know that the nurse was able to stop the line and prevent the doctor from actually amputating on the wrong limb? And finally, in my opinion, the most compelling of it all, how do you calculate something that never happened? How is the value of, what is the value of something that was prevented? It was an anomaly that the Truman Organization did not have the same, a challenge, the same challenges at the height of COVID-19 as other hospitals re, were reporting in the country. Um, they did not report any lack of ventilators, they had their PPE supplies, and they didn't have the same type of capacity shortages. Or was this an anomaly after all? We did a quick query of the database and we found 267 instances where COVID related improvement ideas had results that helped to prevent those issues. Maybe not an anomaly overall, but to dub an old Visa commercial, I would call that priceless. So becoming an HRO is the journey is always continuing. It's not a snapshot in time or a one-time award. It's about people and people change. They leave an organization and they join an organization. They have different priorities in their lives that may or may not distract them in their, in their work life. The better the foundation and not deviating from the norm, the better people can stay on track. People also mature during, those, during their experiences. So not only does this journey continue, but it definitely becomes more interesting, challenging, and exciting along the way. Thank you for the, taking the time to sit with us during this presentation. We'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Jennifer and Tim, what a, what a fascinating journey we have here uh, on, the, on, the, on, on what you have shared with us. It's just, the scale, uh, it's just un unbelievable. Um, incredible results. Congratulations and thanks for taking the time to share with us. So we have some questions that have come up um, that I, I want to share with you. We have another seven or so minutes here when I take this time to do a live Q&A. Um, I have some questions myself, but my questions don't matter. I'm looking at the questions from the audience. And what I see here is that Keith Clean Scales uh, has like the number one voted question so far, and I'm going to relate that to you. And he, he mentions 
The Veteran Affairs is a huge organization. How do you drive employee engagement and excitement about the idea process? And who are the champions, the cheerleaders who drove the change to an improvement culture that you're trying to establish? Jim, I don't know if you want to take that one or if you want me to take that sure. one. I can take that. Uh, and I think like I uh, tried to describe in the opening, it really has mm -hmm. to be the CEO, it has to be the director of the medical centers. It can't come from Washington, D.C. It can't come from the, the network office. It has to come from the local director. And I think some of that is predicated on their resources and, and capacity. It could be that depending on the facility you're looking at, they're not there. They're, they don't have the readiness yet to undergo that kind of change. But we had 18 pilot sites who were trying to replicate what we did at Truman, and they were self-identified identified, and through some objective criteria selected to be the next 18 Truman Medical Centers. So it really has to be predicated on the culture of your facility based on the all-employee survey results and your capacity to under... Really, there's not any reason to, to begin this journey if you don't have a, an adequate lean staff, for instance. We had a master black belt with a two master's degree in engineering and health administration, and he was able to teach black belt classes. And we had over two dozen qualified master black belts at the end of the three years. So they were able to coach the green belt projects and generate that excitement. And then that excitement made it that employees were engaged and they felt like they owned their work processes and they owned how their workflow would go. Which, which helped with retention and it continued and sustained that excitement when you feel like you own your work process. The one thing that I'll just say is we can't stress enough the leadership commitment and it's not just committing funds, it's committing their time, their rounding, they're getting to know people, they're visible, they're not in an in a office taking calls and never around in the facility. That's kind of number one. And, um, I, I think, again, the leadership commitment is is just paramount. And, and they're yeah, visible. Leadership... Yeah, I'm curious about that leadership commitment. Was this an initiative that was driven very much from the top down, or was it an initiative that was, you know, you influenced the top, if you will? What is the involvement of senior leaders in the organization on, on the initiative? So, so their involvement, that's a great question. It, it was not a mandate. It was a coaching and an assisting. It was a transparency that those visual management boards that Jennifer showed you, it, it was hardwired into their contracts. They had to observe 75 of those a year. So as a senior leader, you would go to the board when they did their visual management board rounding and you weren't there to provide answers or solutions. You were there to coach and to help identify barriers to those unit level projects so that they could work the solutions themselves. Which is very thing is, counterintuitive. I think often senior leaders want to go in and fix, and instead of I think fixing, the best you're going. Thing, I think the best thing I can um, describe it is it really does create a flat organization where all members of the organization, whether you are the housekeeper all the way to, like I said, the food service worker, somebody in the pharmacy, logistics, and any clinical, nobody's afraid to speak up. It really does create that flat organization. And to quote one of our colleagues. Um, uh, he he said, I'm not going to stop anybody from saying anything, but some of the things they say to me, you know, are a little bit outrageous, but that's a just culture and that's what we want. We don't want people to shy away. So Very literally good. the this senior leaders get out of the way and they identify barriers. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, clearly this is a very large scale transformation. You have been very successful and congratulations on that. Um, uh, and uh, in what other aspects you think that the transformation that you're doing here uh, is different from what most healthcare organizations are trying to do with improvements and innovations? Um, I'll take that one. So I think I re, you know, I kind of tried to reiterate it through the presentation several times. Everybody does continuous process improvement, but what is the difference between an HRO process improvement and individual process improvements? Think about an elevator. Think about an HRO is not complete until everybody is on the floor at the same time. 
there's many times where a continuous process improvement, hey, we cured cancer or something along those lines happens and the rest of the organization is falling apart. And HRO doesn't allow that. It's one for all and all for one. You're all on the same elevator floor, you know, on the same elevator floor as everybody else. And until everybody gets on that same floor, you're gonna strive to make sure everybody comes up. And then once everybody's on that level, they're gonna get back in the elevator and strive for the next level. That really is the difference between a random one-time continuous process improvement and the entire organization focusing on continuous process improvement or the HRO journey. And simply this put what Jennifer is describing. It sounds that you have really democratized improvement and innovation, make accessible to all in the organization, and uh, and you have very clear mechanism to translate the principles into value creation action. Uh, we're almost out of time, so a quick question, and if you can give me a, a short answer on, um, this is such a big ecosystem. You have so many ideas coming in. Just give a high level view on how you're prioritizing what you need to work on. It, it really is limited by the capacity of the particular unit. So if the unit has the capacity to work on a, a performance improvement project, they will work on it. And it's dependent on that unit's capacity. Right. Jennifer and Tim, thank you so much for sharing this incredible insights on the on the, such a large scale transformation in healthcare, in the, in the government, and the, the services that we're providing to, to veterans. So we're very grateful for all the improvements and innovations we have done in doing that. And uh, you created financial and social value at scale. So thank you for, for that. Thank you, Vitos community. Thank you much. Ladies and gentlemen, that's some of the best of the best when it comes to large scale transformations. And we're gonna follow that up back here on the main stage with a keynote panel on large scale transformations and the secrets to successful large scale transformations. So meet me back here at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time where we're going to welcome a new George from Morningstar, Morningstar Financial. We're gonna have Riaz Attar talking about large scale transformations at Caesars Entertainment and also Kelly Pearson talking about successful large scale transformations and MasterCard. So meet me back here at 10.30. In the meantime, check the other sessions. The recordings are available as soon as the sessions are completed. So go in there and you can watch some of the recordings on the track sessions that happen in parallel with our main stage session. Connect with the virtual booths and win your $1,000 prize by visiting five of them. And connect with other people in the conference, okay, in this ecosystem. The registered participants are here, full profiles. Connect with them, say hello. Don't be shy, you know, this is, this is what this space was designed for, to connect great people and great ideas. So make sure you connect and uh, let's strengthen our community by, by creating stronger bonds. So I'll see you back at 10.30. Thank you for now. <laughs>